last week or two weeks ago, actually, since we, we didn't meet last week, we had begun to uh, discuss what's wrong with Sola Scriptura from a historical point of view, from a theological point of view, for, from a practical point of view. So we moved away from those so-called proofs of Sola Scriptura in scripture, which of course don't actually exist if we look at them in context, um, to more general issues. So we, we discussed the fact that uh, there's no clear definition of inspiration and what it means to be inspired for scripture to be inspired apart from the fact that the church has decided that scripture is inspired and has decided which scripture is inspired so that the church the pre-reformation church decided which books of the bible which books belonged in the new testament so we can't abstract the bible from the church which created and defined the New Testament. We also discussed the so-called lost books of the Bible, which many uh, Protestants believe in. So they believe that you know, uh, the evil Catholic Church suppressed some important books that should have been in the Bible, but somehow aren't. But the interesting thing about that argument is that if it's true, then scripture can't possibly be inspired because scripture becomes, you know, the, the uh, creation, the New Testament becomes the creation of an evil Catholic church and presumably the inspired books have been left out. So that, you know, completely destroys internally the argument of sola scriptura. And, and we examine the, the, the stress, the fact that uh, the New Testament as a canon emerged only uh, in the fourth century. So for three centuries, there was no New Testament. There were individual books that circulated, but no New Testament as, as, a, as a corpus. And therefore, sola scriptura would seem to demand that there be a, uh, that, that scripture precede the church uh, or scripture precede Christianity. If you remember when we were discussing, um, I think when we were discussing atheism, we discussed the, the difficulty of coming to a knowledge of um, Christianity purely based on the Old Testament. And then the final thing we, we examined last uh, two weeks ago was the, the assumption that all you needed was basic literacy to understand scripture. Uh, the problem with that is that most Christians in the early portion, early period of the church were not literate. So uh, demanding literacy sets a very high bar. Uh, so tonight I want to sort of go on with that. So we'll finish, hopefully finish tonight the sort of discussion of general issues. And then next week, I want to address the three questions that we, we uh, that I had, had posed. Uh, so we'll break up probably into two small groups or maybe three small groups and you know, discuss them. So it becomes an exercise and you know, sort of doing our own apologetics and, uh, and trying to put what we've learned into practice and then meeting back together and, and kind of evaluating or reviewing uh, how we've done. So, um, besides the fact of literacy, the, one of the assumptions of sola scriptura is that simply the meaning of scripture is fairly clear, but the problem is that the New Testament was written at a time when the church was persecuted, right? And so there's, 
a problem of what's called Aesopian language. Aesopian language is language that appears to say one thing and really means something else. So in some ways, the, the classic, I guess the classic definition of Aesopian language, it, it comes from um, the struggle against Stalin by uh, his opposition. Uh, so one of his political opponents was, uh, and who had been one of the previous leaders of the Russian Revolution was a man named Nikolai Bukharin. And Bukharin wrote in Pravda a um, editorial asking whether the Pope believed in God. So the significant thing about the editorial is that it had nothing to do with the Pope and nothing to do with God. He was using a Sopian language. And so the question he was asking really wasn't about the Pope and believing in God. It's does, does Stalin believe in communism? And the answer was no. But the problem is that given familiarity with Aesopian language, everybody knew what he was talking about. And so he nevertheless was persecuted for it. But that's not so clear in early Christianity. Um, so let's take a, a, a very simple example. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10. This is also a problem with Eucharistic references in the Bible. Um, although this is a Eucharistic reference. So Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10. Let's begin at verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is well that the heart be strengthened by grace and not by foods which have not benefited their adherents. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. So what does he mean by uh, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat? That's all Old Testament. Uh huh. What the high priest could be in at the altar, right? Um. Yeah, but he's not. He's talking about what you eat, and not um, not necessarily the That's high the priest. Oh, okay. So he says, "Don't be led astray by strange teachings about food." about what you can eat, okay. Right. Okay. So does anyone have any idea of what he's talking about? Who lives and who already died? Um, well, he says, don't be led astray by strange teachings about food. What could he be talking about? And I'm sorry, I'm reading mine in Spanish and this is... <laughs> <laughs> the... Do not be led oh, away yeah, yeah. by diverse and strange teachings, for it is well that the heart be strengthened by grace and not by foods which have not benefited their inheritance. Mm 
ad adherents, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. So what do you eat at the altar? Jesus. Bread of life. Yeah. Which is right. Eucharist. Eucharist. Exactly. It's Eucharist a Eucharistic reference. And, and the so, ones who have no right to eat are those who have sinned and not repented. No, I think he, he's really talking about the purity laws. And so remember wow. that, that the context of the whole letter is that he's writing to Jewish Christians who are in danger of uh, relapsing and returning to Judaism and abandoning Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, the focus of his letter. He's trying to show that Christ is, is a superior high priest, that he supersedes the temple, that the uh, system of temple worship has become obsolete and is fading away. This was almost certainly written before the destruction of the temple in 70. And so the strange teachings is the prohibition of uh, particularly, well, of particularly of drinking blood. So remember that Christians from a very, very early point are accused of cannibalism, right? Because they eat the body and drink the blood of Christ. And, and so you don't particularly want to say that directly since you know the pen pen uh, penalty for it can be death. And certainly for, from the viewpoint of, of, of Judaism, that's completely abhorrent. And the notion that Christ is present in the Eucharist is completely abhorrent. You remember reading chapter six of John's gospel that uh, the reaction to Jesus' bread of life discourse was, uh, this is a hard teaching and large numbers of people walked away. That's when, when uh, Peter says to Jesus, where else can we go? So um, it's a, a, a teaching about, so, Eating flesh is so abhorrent that it's not even mentioned in the Mosaic law and drinking blood is absolutely prohibited. So, so, you, so the author of Hebrews is using Aesopian language to attack the purity laws and say that we have a table with the body and blood of Christ present that those who minister in the tent, that priests cannot participate in, cannot consume because it violates the Mosaic law. So it's an Aesopian reference. It uses Aesopian language to cloak the meaning of what the author is saying, but early Christians would understand that meaning. Is that clear? Now it is. <laughs> Thank you. So, so that's um, a, a really important thing to always try to keep in mind that you know the the apparently surface meaning is not always the clear one. But sorry, can you please repeat again what you said about the priest? Because um, in mine is uh, the beginning in the verses nine, and is the part of you said that is ten, but at the end is uh, that we have a, a a table in. Yeah, the last part. Can you explain it, please, a little bit more? Well, when you mentioned something about the priest, that they have no right to attend. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, 
We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. Yeah. So ordinarily the priest offers sacrifices to God and some are burned, but others are eaten by the priest. But at the altar of the mass, we don't have meat that's sacrificed to God. We have the body and blood of Christ and consuming body and, and, and the early church um, starting with, with uh, you know, Jesus, the, the Last Supper believed that Christ was physically present in the Eucharist, in the Mass. So, and, and was really present. So what you were eating was the body and blood of Christ. What you were consuming is the body and blood of Christ. A Jewish priest cannot do consume the body and blood of Christ because that violates the Mosaic mm -hmm. law. There's a strong prohibition against drinking blood. Um, oh. If you drink blood, you are cast out from the community according to the Mosaic law. <clears throat> so it's a veiled reference to the Eucharist and something that a priest is not allowed to do, but something that's intrinsic to Christian worship and to the Christian mass. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, there's also the problem of multiple interpretations that can be assigned to uh, basically, you know, the same basic statement that, you know, symbolism can be used to express something in a variety of ways. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 27. Verses 50 and 51. Actually, through verse 53. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So the temple veil torn in two, uh, apocalyptic imagery, an earthquake, rocks splitting, and uh, dead people resurrected and wandering around Jerusalem. Let's look at Hebrews, again, chapter 10. So then the question is, what does John, what does Matthew mean by what he said? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, 
let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So does anyone see the relationship between those two statements? The sanctuary is now open to everyone. Right. Not just the priests. Right. So the two statements are identical. And although you can perhaps interpret Matthew literally, it's also very likely that he's simply being symbolic, particularly earlier he had ridiculed the use of uh, the expectation of apocalyptic Im imagery. So the earthquake and the rocks are very likely to be symbolic. Ta the, the tearing of the temple veil in two on the eve of the Passover would necessitate the purification of the temple. So we don't know of Passover not being celebrated. And so that likely is symbolic uh, also. And especially given that um, the general, I mean, in, in the early church, the, the notion was that um, Jesus replaced the institutions of Jewish worship. So Jesus himself was, became the temple. That's really a fundamental uh, principle in John's gospel where John really moves it to the fore. And you know, the notion that the dead people were wandering around seems, although you know, certainly God can raise people from the dead, but uh, it seems rather that he's simply pointing to uh, the hope of the resurrection rather to, than to an actual resurrection. Uh, and also Jesus hasn't been resurrected yet. So, you know, it seems unlikely someone, people would be resurrected in advance of Jesus who is, uh, as Paul says, the first fruit. So this is about the temple veil being torn. You know, so the, the, the notion that it was intrinsic to um, early, well, was intrinsic to Judaism and then carried over into Christianity is that the temple was a mirror and an image of the heavenly sanctuary, right? And so the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, does everyone know about the holy place and the whole holy of holies, or does everyone know what the holy of holies was? No. Well, sacred part of the temple, and only one rabbi could go into it once a year. Not rabbi, only the high priest. Oh, the high priest, and he could only go in once a year. Right. And they had to tie him to a rope. They had he had a rope around his waist in case he died in there. Right. And they had to drag him out. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. So once a year, the high priest would go in for to sacrifice a bull and a goat. The bull was for the sins of the priest. The goat was for the sins of the people. The bull was, uh, uh, I guess you could say, a representation of the golden calf mm. or an atonement for the golden calf. Um, so effectively, and, and so that curtain, that veil was like a thick, very, very thick, I forget how thick, like one foot, two feet, thick woolen uh, thing that was like 30 by 30 or so. 
and blocked off the, the Holy of Holies, uh, where the high priest could only go once a year from the holy place, which is where most sacrifices occurred and where the priests ministered. So it was not inaccessible. Only that, not only that, but the way it tore, apparently, if it was if it was real, the way it tore from the top down was not natural because if it was going to tear, it would have been from the bottom up. Uh-huh. But it but so whether it was real or not, that's they right. they they just showed how supernatural the whole thing, the event was so um strong or so mm -hmm. unusual right <clears throat> so so the um so the fact that the veil so the, the, the temple veil represents uh the inaccessibility of god god is not very accessible. God is present on the one hand, but but not um, readily accessible. What, Connie? Red is not readily accessible. Right, not readily accessible. That doesn't yeah. make sense. And and remember also in the Old Testament, God speaks sometimes to kings, but you know largely to prophets, and it's not that you know one ordinarily hears. He doesn't speak to people as a whole so the death of christ indicates that the te the the temple veil has been torn that ac access to god has now become free yeah that, so it's a big change so right? it's a huge change it's right big, yes and so that's the point of those two passages it's really an eschatological change Matthew has has talked about you know, throughout his gospel talks about the nearness of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as as he calls it, and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And uh, the point of the the, cruci the death of Christ is that now the kingdom of heaven is really at hand. It's much more more at hand than it was previously. The death of Christ marks an apocalyptic and eschatological event. So those two passages say the same thing, although they don't you know, necessarily appear to, unless you're reading within a particular tradition. And, uh, and that tradition is really not part of, of Protestant uh, interpretation. So questions about that? If um, sola scriptura is true, then the Bible contains <clears throat> if sola scriptura is true, then the Bible should contain all the revelation that's needed, and it shouldn't say that revelation may be missing, right? Yeah. And yet it does. Let's take a look at John's gospel. Let's first look at the very end. The last verse of John's gospel, chapter 21, verse 25. But there are also many other things which Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So the implication is that there are 
other things that some of them have been preserved in oral tradition, that the Bible doesn't contain all revelation. Then let's go back a bit to John chapter 14. Verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your re remembrance all that I have said to you. So an important you know, conclusion to be drawn from that is that there will be further revelation, but not all revelation is contained in scripture. And indeed, you know, if we look at the, if we look at the disciples, you know, in their reaction to Jesus' teaching, you know, we see that they have, uh, at best, a very partial knowledge. They, in some sense, don't fully grasp the meaning of uh, Jesus' ministry, of Jesus' death, or of Jesus' resurrection until afterwards. So from that viewpoint, you know, revelation comes later. In Matthew chapter 28. Verse 20. that started verse 16, the very end of St. Matthew's Gospel. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. Now, if scripture is the sole source of authority, then why do we need Jesus to be with us always to the close of the age. Presumably, if sola scriptura is true, he's left everything that we need to know in scripture, right? So there's no need for him to be with us always to the close of the age, unless he's done a really poor job It's just to encourage us to carry on in the hardest times. Well, he said that he will be he will be with the disciples, even though not presently, but uh, in spirit. Isn't that what he said here? Yeah. So he's trying to let them know that 
to have courage that the road isn't very smooth ahead of them and that he will be there to support yeah. their, their fight or whatever. Yeah, the, the end of the scripture said that. He said, behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. Right. So Jesus continues to be present. Yeah. But if Sola Scriptura is true, then why does he need to be present? Well, probably to help. I said, does it have something to do with the historical teachings of of um, Jesus and not just the um, teachings of the the teachings that he had to do with the resurrection? Um, well, I mean, the the the. the I mean, the, the point that I'm really trying to make is much more simple than that. It's that if scripture contains all revelation, then Jesus does not need to be present anymore. We have scripture. Okay. If we have, if we have scripture, we don't need Jesus. He doesn't need to be <laughs> present. Okay. But he said that he would be present, and he is present. And... You know, indeed, I mean, you know, there's the whole issue of the infallibility of the church. Why is the church and its dogmatic pronouncements infallible? Because Jesus has been present and continues to guide the church. So, you know, if we look at uh, Catholic and, and for that matter, if we look at Greek Orthodox doctrine, we see continuity over you know 2000 years of church history despite you know despite uh, good popes and bad popes despite periods of decline of faith and periods of growth of faith to, despite periods of decay despite periods of scandal despite periods of uh, being overrun by sin despite periods of huge ebbs in faith through all of those things, through all of crises and victories. And the, the church has preserved basically its doctrine unchanged. It's developed doctrine, but it's developed doctrine in a way that is compa compatible with the original doctrine and hasn't changed it. So we see enormous continuity you know, we don't see that in uh, Protestant denominations. So, is that clear? Yeah. There's also this, it's not so much true of Luther or Calvin, but it's certainly true of post uh, of later uh, Protestant and especially evangelical uh, thought. There's a sort of view of the dictation theory of scripture. So, you know, it's as if the gospel writer or uh, Paul or the other letter writers uh, of the canon of the New Testament, or for that matter, uh, you know, the writers of the Old Testament as well, as if they sort of sat down and they had this, you know, sort of earpiece and God dictated to them and they wrote down exactly what God said, um, which is, you know, in some sense, fails to explain divergences of scripture uh, and sort of the, the difference in approach, say, between Matthew and Luke and Mark and John. Um, and also, uh, there's a really great study of the prophets by a uh, Jewish scholar named Abraham Heschel, who was himself a, a major uh, Jewish theologian as well as a scholar and humanist. <clears throat> 
So in his study of the prophets, he showed how the prophetic message delivered to each prophet was tailored to that prophet so that the message was phrased to the prophet in a way that the prophet was capable of understanding given who he was and given you know, his contact text and background. Uh, so the message was molded to the prophet. God spoke to each prophet in terms that he could understand and called him to a mission that he was capable of doing. So it's matter, not a matter of you know, sort of simple dictation, which in many ways, um, you know, I think, robs scripture of its wealth and its richness. So I think I mentioned that one of the assumptions of both Calvin and Luther was that their interpretation of scripture was the correct one. So in some form, they both assumed that you know, there was a correct interpretation and there was a wrong interpretation. But the problem is that in, in Calvin's case in rejecting tradition and in Luther's case in uh, partially rejecting tradition and in making scripture the sole source of authority removed from uh, you know, the context in which scripture was defined, developed and interpreted, it really opened the door for um, a view that scripture is self-interpreting and anyone's interpretation of scripture is valid. Now that's something that certainly Calvin and Luther would have turned in their graves over. They certainly would have not uh, agreed with that at all. But that's fundamental to uh, the Baptist tradition and to all of the, the uh, you know, denominations that have spawned from uh, Baptist, the Baptists. So, so in America, that's true of every Protestant denomination except the Reformed Church, which is Calvinist. Um, so that becomes a complete nightmare. That means that you know there are what seven, eight billion people in the world and there can be seven or eight billion different interpretations of the same basic scripture. And they're all correct because the Holy Spirit speaks to each person. And you know those eight billion can also be mutually incompatible and are certainly going to be mutually incompatible. So from the viewpoint of sola scriptura, that's not, you know, that's not a problem, but in fact, it's a, a severe problem. Well then, when you, you know, flipping through on my radio or on TV, you see these different preachers. So why are they saying this is what I think? If it's all inspired and, and everything is in the Bible, then there shouldn't be interpretations by individuals. If everything was in the Bible, as said. Well, the, I mean, there's room for interpretations by individuals and there's room for you know sort of creativity and in interpretation i mean the 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 actual number of verses that in the catholic tradition have to be understood in a particular way is very limited so there's a great deal of freedom of interpretation but 
But the bigger thing is that interpretation, that, that tradition provides a context within which scripture is understood and interpreted. And so that's sort of the really big thing. There's a, 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 a video from uh, Bishop Barron in which he talks about sola scriptura and uh, the Catholic Church. And fundamentally, the, it's not so much that the Catholic Church defines the meaning of uh, very many verses or particularly defines uh, you know, specific interpretations is that it serves as sort of a referee that determines what's in bounds and out of bounds and what the rules are. And so that tradition is extremely critical. Um, Thank you, I'll have to read some of this. So that's, um, so, it's um, the the question, you know, then becomes: Does interpretation fall within, you know, the context of a particular of of the Catholic tradition for Catholics and for others? It's really, you know, does. Um, The, I mean, one can argue, you know, that, that, well, I mean, there are, I mean, you know, taking the say, evangelical fundamentalism or taking premillennial dispensationalism, I mean, there are really two issues. There's one issue of does the interpretation which occurs within the context of the, of the theological tradition does it make any sense? You know, so for premillennial dispensationalism, there are seven dispensations. And um, as we, a dispensation ends fundamentally when God's plan for salvation goes awry and God has to try something else. So although it's not stated, you know, the, 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 at least from my perspective, the implication is that God is a stupid, incompetent bungler. And so, you know, the stuff he tries fails and it's kind of, oh my goodness, oy vey, back to the drawing board, <laughs> right? So I got to try something else. And so we have, you know, the switching of the scenes and trying something else. And we have, uh, you know, Christ comes to save the Jews, but they reject him, which God didn't foresee. So he does, you know, the Christians, but he's got to go back to the Jews because then it's, it's like, you know, there's this shifting of the historical scene. So shiftings of the historical scene violate the Catholic conception, the Christian conception of history particularly the Catholic uh, conception of history as it was formulated by St. Vincent of Lorraine, there cannot be shifting of the historical scenes. There can be continuities and discontinuities. And within Christian <laughs> history, there can only be one continuity, the continuity of the church from its inception by Christ until the second coming. So that's fundamental. So when you depart outside of that, you depart from a fundamental, Christian, a fundamental Christian understanding of history. And that means also a fundamental Christian understanding of scripture. And then we also you know, have the second kind of view that you know, the Holy Spirit speaks to me and, and so that's, you know, which is fundamental in uh, premillennial dispensationalism and most evangelical fundamentalism. So, so I, you know, pick up the Bible and often the view is that, you know, God will direct me or the Holy Spirit will direct me to you know, the particular verse that 
he wants me to read and then I'll read and Judas killed himself and then I'll wonder what to do about it. Uh, but so, you know, the, the, so God directs me to where and then gives me this private message. Yeah. But why would there be a private message? Why would there be a meaning that is, you know, sort of private to me? And is it really all about me? And so, you know, we end up without a, a uh, without a context within which to understand what it is scripture is saying to us. Well, you know, it's, I think a lot of people who go into the Bible and look at scripture are going for a reason to try and find answers, but they all have their own individual need for what they're looking for and how they're going to um, interpret the scripture right. to fit their needs. And uh -huh. if everybody does that, that's not doing what, what Christ wanted when he told the apostles, you know, when Christ was telling them, go as I command you to teach, you right. know, baptize and teach the nations so that you can pass on my teaching and my word. Mm -hmm. the word of God and right. without um, the right source the church like we have the deacons bishops the pope without the um, authority on the the people to uphold the true meaning it goes haywire and there all of a sudden there is no shepherd to guide the flock there's a million shepherds and the flock is going crazy, scattered all over the place. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That's, yeah, that's very true. Also, uh, something you said earlier, Terry, that people are, you know, sort of going, looking in search of something that meets their private needs. Right. There's sort you know, of their own needs. Yeah, there's this real problem, you know, that of essentially ransacking scripture. You know, so the unfortunate thing is that if you want to find something in scripture, whatever it is, you know, you're going to find it. You know, so if you want to, so remember, you know, that white supremacists generally consider themselves Christian. Uh, people who you know don't believe who believe interracial marriage is a sin generally back up their position with scripture things that you know are will are extremely simple and evil are often justified by reliance on scripture so, you know, if you ransack scripture looking for something to meet your personal needs, however perverted those personal needs are, you're going to find it because you're looking for something that meets your personal needs and it's become abstracted from a context within which scripture can be understood. And we see that in Jesus teaching uh, about divorce in particular and, uh, and elsewhere as well, but, but the Pharisees have focused on uh, the, most, the bill of divorce and the Mosaic law, 
as an exit from divorce. Whereas God's intention is that uh, through marriage, a man and a woman become one flesh that really uh, negates the possibility of divorce or, or negates the, the um, what is the word? It means that divorce is a concession, but a concession to our weakness and our sinfulness and, and that divorce violates the heart of God, which is that two people become one. So there's this self-interested view of scripture and a self-interested interpretation of scripture. So, so the spirit of you know, sola scriptura became, I mean, it's certainly not with Calvin and Luther, but it became, you know, what works for me? Right, yeah, and in doing that, they can dumb it down as much as they want to suit their needs, rather than, because that's the easiest way for them, rather than really checking for the true meaning for, you know, what Christ was teaching. Mm -hmm. Right. So then... A related to that, you know, a fundamental uh, historical problem. I mean, we, we, we discussed the historical problem of the fact that sola scriptura would seem to require that scripture predate the church, whereas the church creates the New Testament. But the second historical problem is that it completely fails to account for heresy. So heresy is, is uh, something that arose out of a um, ambiguity in the understanding and the teachings of the church. So, and typically, you know, it was based on scripture, not, not, uh, not always. The, the Gnostic heresy wasn't particularly scriptural, but most of the Christological controversies in, in the church were very much based on, on, on scripture. Um, so there's a complete failure to understand those. And I think, you know, in many ways for um, good reason that you know, we end up um, heretical beliefs have become very, very easy and very, very common in modern Christianity. I think, too, another problem with being able to flip through the Bible and point to something that you think God wants you to know is that it may not be they may not read the whole chapter. And so, you know, you can always interpret anything the way you want it, even though it may, it may be taken completely out of context. Like, right. like a, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, we, we can do whatever we want to get back at somebody if we want, because what they do to us, we can do to them or something. <laughs> uh -huh. and that's not exactly what the message was all about. No, no. And in fact, Jesus rejected an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But the problem is that when, um, well, we'll discuss this when we discuss biblical literalism, which is a whole new layer of horrible issues on top of sola scriptura, the notion that every word of the Bible is literally true and that there are no contradictions is patently absurd, completely ridiculous and utterly false and really reduces the, garb uh, the Bible to fundamentally a piece of garbage. It, it completely drains it of any meaning and completely obscures God.
Um, so, Ron, you wanna Ron, you wanna read Rosario's um, chat? He's asking a question. Um, I'm not with priest homilies. Uh huh. But maybe that's in the chapter that you told us. Oh, it's different. Um. What do you mean by uh, does, how does this relate to homilies, Rosaria? Oh, but there was the um, when they say that you take the message, so uh, and it's uh, especially a personal needs or something like that was related to that. So if every uh, priest has their own um, interpretation, uh, history or culture or I don't know, they they have to follow the rules, right? Uh, to give the message, but every person has a different way to, I would say to to, to put it together the the message, mm -hmm. and and the message will be, I would say that for me it is sometimes different. It is from one person or another person that explains or the meaning that they that that they trying to give or the, the explanation right. could be related to that or no? I mean, it's, it's a question of, I mean, so, um, so I think, I mean, there are a number of things that first priests are trained, you know, within a, a tradition and so, I mean, on the one hand, every priest is different and every priest is going to, you know, on, on any given week, given that, you know, the same readings are, are used, uh, nevertheless, homilies are going to be completely different. Mm -hmm. But the question really isn't, are they, are they different? The question I think is, are they incompatible? Um, you know, so typically not, typically simply, you know, there's a focus on different aspects uh, of an issue or different aspects of the readings. But uh, at least, I mean, I've found that, and, you know, some uh, priests are better preachers than others. And so, you know, sometimes homilies are boring. And other times they're enlivening and other times they're enlightening but uh, but rarely you know have I at least I've found that there is uh, you know uh, anything that departs from the foundations of the faith or anything that you know seems objectionable so uh, priests you know generally preach within the confines of, of the tradition. And so that leaves you a good deal of freedom and flexibility. Uh, but it also imposes you know, sort of limits on um, what you can do and say. Those limits aren't you know, a hard set of rules. They're a way of understanding scripture. So we begin, how do we understand scripture? We begin with the individual work that the author has written, right? So the fundamental question, what is the literal meaning of scripture in the Catholic church? The literal meaning of scripture is, is defined by St. Augustine, who said that scripture, the literal meaning of scripture is what the author literally intended to mean, right? That isn't necessarily literal as it's understood, but the starting point always has to be what is the author saying? And then you go, you know, from there, 
that becomes a starting point and that be provides a basic context within which you are going to understand scripture. There's a whole context for the particular book of the Bible and that and, and you can't take individual verses out of context. You have to view a work of the Bible as a whole. So you have to have a certain amount of I'll use the word integrity for lack of a better words, but I think integrity is a good one to, to not violate the author's intent and to not cherry pick stuff and to not pick and choose things you like. And also, you know, to the, 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 the readings from the Old Testament, from the New Testament and the gospel reading are, are integrated. So they all relate to a single theme and that, that integration has been a part of church tradition for a very long time. So you, you, in some sense, are bound by that tradition and that integration. So, you know, it, if you, you can't depart from it without, you know, really making a profound mistake. Does that help to answer yeah, the question. Thank you. And so there is in interpretation, there is enormous freedom, but it's all freedom within particular bounds. You know, so you know, we can't as well, you know, when, when we interpret scripture, when we understand scripture we you know we can't step outside the bounds we can't you know embrace uh doctrines that are non-catholic we you know for example we can't believe that that every word is literally true uh we we have to uh in terms of our understanding of the old and the new testament we have to under have to see that the Old Testament points forward to Christ in the New Testament. And Christ in the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. That you know is sort of fundamental, and so we don't you know do anything that violates that sort of core principle. Is if we do, we sort of level the testaments and deny who Christ is, which is very common in, among some of our separated brethren they they uh and especially if every word is literally true then you know the old and the new testaments are equal and you can pick and choose whatever you like from them thank you So it's the problem of heresy. Um, and there's also basically, so we're out of time. So just one quick quotation from John Henry Newman, which I think summarizes the, the problem here. Uh, he says that the Bible's inspiration does but guarantee its truth but not its interpretation. So in order for the Bible to be true, it has to be properly interpreted. The Bible is always true, but its truth depends on interpretation. Without proper interpretation, the Bible becomes untrue. not because it's inherently untrue, but because it's being used to support untruths. So, um, or a second thing, Second Peter one twenty. no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. So, So is this all clear? Is this helpful? Is this confusing? <laughs>
I'm with. sorry, you are too advanced for me. <laughs> Do, do we feel like we can defend the faith and attack Sola Scriptura? <laughs> with all my heart, yes, but no with all the arguments that you have. <laughs> the, the important thing, you know, I mean, the... Um, I'm ready. <laughs> you know, part of, of being an apologist is is uh, you know that you, that it well it should defending the faith should be fun right <laughs> and um, defending the truth of the faith should be fun and also recognizing so th th there's a way that as Catholics we tend to be intimidated by often what we think is, you know, the superior knowledge or the superior something of superior, particularly the superiority, superior uh, familiarity of our separated brethren with scripture. But in fact, I don't, they're not really, um, they're typically less familiar with scripture than Catholics are, even when Catholics haven't, you know, extensively studied scripture. You know, if you go to weekly mass in the course of you know, the three-year cycle, um, you know, you have a, a, a <coughs> really extensive overview of scripture. And, uh, and then, you know, it, it is elucidated through the priest's homily in ways that are, you know, compatible with Catholic teaching and the Catholic faith. So through that, you know, in many ways, unbeknownst to us mm -hmm. as Catholics, we 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 do develop a, a fairly good uh, basis in Scripture that is typically far, you know, broader than many of our separated brethren who tend, you know, where, where there's cherry picking and taking things out of context. And, you know, so, uh, so, I mean, for me personally, when I, I, I think this is fun, um, to, it's, I'm outraged by the way in which I see scripture used. Um, I find, you know, taking something out of context outrageous. I, you know, find that uh, as, you know, an intellectual, intellectual integrity is something that I, you know, value very much. Taking stuff out of context simply lacks intellectual integrity. It's unacceptable. It, you know, is equivalent to lying and it, you know, outrages me. So apologetics, you know, is a good opportunity to express your outrage, mm -hmm. hopefully in a way that, you know, will uh, expose someone to the truth without going, you know, overboard and being angry and whatever. Religion is one of those topics that, that you can get really heated very quickly. Yes. Don't this agree. is true. <laughs> this is true. It's also amazing very often um, what people think Catholicism is. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have been astounded sometimes at what people say and just... Uh -huh. Oh my goodness, no. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. No. <laughs> right. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there are, I, I think there are enormous misconceptions so that people just believe stuff that is absurd. And when they do, it's hard to, you know, convince them that that's not quite the way it is. But then the, there, there's a second Thing that, that there, there's an assumption that all Catholics are fundamentally stupid 
and ignorant and brainwashed. So, you know, it's kind of like the Pope tells you what to believe, your priest tells you what to believe, and that's, you know, kind of how, how the whole thing works. So you've been spoon fed these lies by the priest and you're capable of, you know, sprouting them back, but, you know, you're not capable of any understanding or anything. And so if you can argue in an articulate way, then often people are sharp, you know, and it's like they have to listen because they have no, no retort. You know, I, I had a discussion about Christian eschatology or Catholic eschatology once with someone where, where he asked me what I thought about Jesus' second coming. And he was expecting that he was going to, you know, tell me all about the rapture and enlighten me and, and uh, you know, maybe even make a convert away from Catholicism to whatever. And, you know, I told him the Catholic teaching and the basis for the Catholic teaching and how any other teaching was absurd. And, and he had nothing you know, to say. He, because his assumption was that Catholics are stupid. Here's another stupid Catholic and I'll enlighten him. So th I think that's very common among particularly evangelicals who think, you know, that they sort of have command of the Bible when in fact they don't. In fact, they often know very little about the Bible. So any other thoughts or comments or questions or anything of the sort? Thank you for everything. Oh, you're welcome. So next week we'll address the three questions. What we'll probably do is like have 15 minutes to discuss the question. Does everyone still have them? Some no, are. could you resend them? I'll resend them, yeah. Please. Mm-hmm, certainly. 